but he is quiet in this church this morning. What a while ago, y'all was worshiping well. I tried to get on the last little bit of it, trying to tie up some loose ends before I come up out here. But stand on your feet this morning. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer again. I know we've already prayed. Sister Kathy and Brother Jack has done a great job this morning. Every time Brother Jack takes the offering up, we take up more offering during the time he takes it up. Brother Richard said it's because of his humbleness and his sincerity and humility. I believe that. Because he's not forcing you to give. He's humbly entreating you to give. There's something about giving that way. That's how we should give. I want you to reach your hands up toward heaven. And then I want you to reach one of them toward me. I want you to ask God to help me this morning and touch me. I need his touch today. I've had a tough time this past week, and I ain't even going to talk about me this morning. I'm going to talk about Jesus, but I need his touch this morning in my body. I really do. And I know you do too. And there's a lot of people sick, and we've prayed for them. But let's pray for this service this morning that God would touch. If he touches nothing but my mouth, I'm good with that. As long as it'll say his word, I'm all right with that. Give me just a few moments of strength that I can do what I need to do for you. In the name of Jesus, let's pray. Can we do that? Father, we do love you this morning, and we thank you for another privilege and time to come to your house. We thank you for the opportunity to be a body, which is the body of Christ. We're not the entire body, but we are this part of the body here at Sweetwater Church of God. Father, we, we are thankful that you have brought us in. We, did, we didn't come to church. You brought us into your kingdom. You translated us into the kingdom of your dear son. You redeemed us with the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, we are sons and daughters of the Most High God today. And we have entitlements. We have, oh God, the ability to cry, Abba, Father. We have the Holy Spirit that helpeth our infirmities. And he prayeth for us when, with, when we do not know how to pray as we ought with groanings that cannot be uttered. Father, today I'm asking you to touch us and touch the congregation and touch myself, my body. As I stand here, God, I want to be humble before you. I want to I want to ask you and, and beseech you to touch, heal, and give us direction. Speak through my vocal cords. Use my lips as your lips today. And let my mind, hallelujah, be the mind of Christ this very moment and this very time. God, I will gladly be spent for you at this time. And however you choose to orchestrate the rest of this service this morning, I believe you will be in full control. Not that you need to hear it or you need it, but God, I give this whole service and body in this church into your control. I am not in control. You are in control of our lives. And not that you need to hear that, but I want to tell you that in front of your people, in front of everything this morning. I praise you for what's about to happen. I praise you for the results that will be done through the great name of Jesus Christ. And I praise you for the longevity of those results. And years after today, when we look back, we will say that morning and that moment changed me and changed my life forever. And I am better because of Jesus and his love. Now I want you to take those hands and I want you to clap them as loud as you can for Jesus. Come on. Let's just praise him a minute. Oh, we love you.
I hear the Holy Ghost saying, tell them, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so. Tell him how much you love him. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him, saints of God. Praise him, ye his people. Woo! The psalmist said, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord shall be praised. We praise you today and we give you glory and honor. For where we are weak, O oh God, thou art strong. For where we are limited, you are unlimited. And we praise you for this moment. We praise you for this time. Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many feels better after that praise and that time to give him some glory? Listen to me, at any time while I'm preaching that you just want to jump up and give God some high praise, it will not disturb me. Matter of fact, it'll help me. I can't believe at times how quiet we really are when I think about his goodness and what he's done for me. I can't believe that we don't have a song perpetually on our hearts and our lips. Woo. Holy Ghost. Ooh, I sense the wind of the Spirit blowing in this room. Breathe upon us, O oh God. One more time. Breathe upon us. You know, I, I'm amazed at how 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 tight the scriptures are with their information and evidence. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he also formed Adam. Formed Adam. Formed Adam out of the dust of the earth laying there in God's hands was a lifeless piece of clay with no animation no praise but the Bible says at that moment God see the need of man before Adam ever prayed oh my God before Adam ever called out to God for prayer in prayer and asked Jehovah for anything God saw the need before man had life. And he breathed into Adam the breath of life. At that moment, the Bible said that Adam became, I like this, a living soul. He was able to think and function, calculate. He was able to walk, speak. Isn't it amazing that God didn't have to teach Adam how to speak? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, he didn't have a mom and a daddy. Whoo! He didn't have no mom and daddy to take him to school and teach him A, B, C, teach him how to walk. But when he got up out of God's hand, he was a walking, talking Listen, he was the first man. But see, I didn't come here today to celebrate my humanity. I didn't come here to celebrate my humanity. I thank God for Adam, who's really the father of us all. 
Hey, it, it didn't start with two human beings, y'all. Uh, hey, we all can. It don't matter who you are. We all are kin some kind of way. Two humans. But that first man got up, walked around, and felt the sensation and the life of, the, of Jehovah God running through his veins. Felt the power. But I didn't come here to celebrate humanity. Humanity has let us down. Even in on our best days, we are not even close to being good. Help me, church people. This ain't my sermon, but hey, it's good. Even on our best days, we are not capable of walking close to God. And for thousands of years, we stayed separated from God. Think about that. No love. Only rituals and rules and ordinances. And the best we could do was walk into a tabernacle and slay an animal, offer incense. That was it. But today, today I come to celebrate the second Adam. Who is Jesus Christ. Where Adam failed in disobedience, Jesus succeeded in obedience. Through one man's life, the Bible said all of us were made sinners. But through the life and death of another man, we all became the children of God. And can become the children of God. I celebrate Jesus in this room. Don't you? How many realizes without the second Adam and his sacrifice, his person, his obedience? Mm. Think about this. What if all your closest friends abandoned you? And the hardest road you ever went up was before you. And you faced that road alone. I dare say most of us would have said, hold on. Something ain't right here. I don't think I can make this. But I am glad every day that I live, whether I feel like it or not, whether I feel it or not, I'm glad for Jesus who decided to walk up a hill all alone. This is what I'm concerned about at times. Not in here because we hear it. In song, in message. People that come that preach. But I'm concerned that the church is too caught up in their things. We're too caught up in the rules of Christianity. And we have got forgotten the person of Christianity. The reason we are here is Jesus. Not because we're good enough. Not because we're gifted enough. Not because you're called enough. It's because Jesus is Jesus. And he's alive today. Hallelujah. That's why we are here And if he takes every gift from me and my life and I and everything is gone, he will still be worthy of the praise and the honor and the glory. One of the most puzzling questions I ask myself at times is this. If a real Christian knows that, why is it so difficult to get them to praise him? Why is it so hard for us to honor him and praise him? I'll tell you why. Because in our nature is still that first Adam. It wants to suppress the second Adam. Mm. Don't make me take you all the way back to the other story.
couple other boys born. One of them was born first, but the other one caught his heel coming. Mm -mm -mm. It wasn't the first one that brought the blessing. It was the second one and which brought the blessing upon him, all Israel. It ain't the first one that brought me in. Yeah, I'm in this world because of the first one, but I'm going to another world because of the second one. I'm in this world because of Adam, but I look for a city whose builder and maker is God because of the second one. Woo! I am sick at times because of the first one, but I am healed, hallelujah, because of the second one. Can somebody shout glory to God? Woo! I would be forever lost because of the first one. But because of the second one, I am saved, hallelujah, by the grace of Almighty God. By the first one, I am empty and desolate of the presence of God. But because of the second one, he sent the Holy Ghost back as a gift to my life. Do you see the importance of the worship and the praise of Jesus Christ? Can we do it one more time while we're talking about him? Can we just give him some spontaneity praise? Come on, just give him some of that praise. Hallelujah. Woo. He saved us. He sanctified us. He Holy Ghost baptized us. He wrote my name in a book where the devil can't erase it. Does that make anybody happy in this room here today? He's prepared a place for you. And he said, if I go, I shall come again. And I shall receive you unto myself. Because where I am, there you may be. A Is anybody happy about any of that information here today? Oh, God. Listen. Their church is fussing about what colors they like, how big the building needs to be, what the choir needs to sing. And we're missing the opportunity to prepare ourselves for the coming of Jesus. And the devil has got people preoccupied all over the world with little frivolous things that don't matter. Hey, look here. When you say it don't matter if the, pur the, the carpet's purple with pink polka dots on it. I can shout on anything knowing that I've been saved. Hallelujah. I've been saved by his grace. Who's on the praise team don't really matter when you got a praise in your heart for the one who saved you. You stop comparing yourselves among yourselves when you realize that the most important thing is to keep Jesus in focus. Are you with me? Hallelujah, hallelujah. You can be seated if you want to. I feel that second Adam surging through me.
Somebody praise the Lord in this room here today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We do love you today, and we thank you. I can't give you enough praise, Father. Son of God, I cannot give you enough praise. Hallelujah. I want you to look at your neighbor on each side of you and I want you to say this to them. Aren't you glad you go to a church where you can hear from God on any given day? The Lord is moving in this church. He's speaking in this church and He's changing me in this church. Ladies and gentlemen, beloved of God, children of God, do you know that there are places who have grown quiet to the voice of God? They no longer allow the Spirit to move and the gifts to move through their people. The channel of His enlightenment and revelation has long grown cold. They survive on past experience. Years old worth of bread they hear it, and no one is living and breathing. Let me tell you, but when God gets to talking and moving and I miss, your very body begins to react to the Creator. In Him we, in Him we, we live and move and what? And have our being. In Him, in Him we live and move <laughs> and have I been in him in him you take him out I, I don't live no more I don't move no more I don't have my being no more but in him I'm in him somebody shout I'm in him that him is Jesus Woo. that's why Satan don't want you close to him that's why he don't want you in him because once you get into him, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to get you out of him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Once you get into him, you start getting touched and healed. Things change. Your perspective, your view, your battles become battles of victory instead of defeat. Huh. I, I'm going to try to preach a little bit. I've been preaching a little bit since I was fixing to preach a little bit. My old, my, I say my older, my, my, gone, my long gone deceased pastor who invited me into the church of God. He told me one morning early we were praying he said, Brother Pierre, I've never seen a man who could warm up preaching as good as you. He said, I, I ain't never seen nobody like that. He said, you can warm up preaching. And then you preach. And he said, I don't get it. He said, but I like it. And I told him, I said, thank you, Pastor. Hmm. You need somebody in your life that sees what you can't see. You need somebody in your life that will shoot you straight. You need somebody in your life close enough to tell you when you're making mistakes and love and tell you that with love. And you need to be able to accept that criticism at times in a constructive way and not a destructive way. Hmm. I thank God for that man. I told his family when he passed away I was a pallbearer. 
I told him, I said, I was a young, struggling evangelist, barely making it. And I said, only heaven knows how many times that pastor of mine met me at the back door and slipped a check in my hand with no one seeing and said, I love you. And he said, I believe in you, Brother Napier. Then he'd say, well, I, I can't. He said, I believe in the God that's in you. Do you have anybody like that in your life? If you don't, you need somebody. At times, I'm that somebody to you. And at times, you are that somebody for me. Hallelujah. You feel good in this room here today? I'm going to preach to you. I want you to turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 1. Well, because I feel resurrection power, I'm going to resurrect something. Huh. I'm going to resurrect an old, an old message of mine. When I mean old, I'm talking about the last time I preached this, my hair was the color of this speaker without even a hint of gray. But I remember the day I preached this. I cannot tell you how many lost people and backslid people came to Jesus. About 15 years after I preached it, a man walked up to me in a store. And he handed me an item, and I'll tell you about it in a minute. He handed me an item, and he said, do you see that? I said, yeah. He said, you remember that? And when I saw it, I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. He said, you preached about this. And he said, the day you preached about it changed my life. And he said, that's the same one you gave me that night. He said, every time I look at it, he said, I realize, man, Jesus is the answer. Amen. See, we got to be careful that we don't preach ourselves. Paul said, I don't preach myself. I preach Jesus and him crucified. Hey, if my sermon's about me, it ain't gospel. The gospel is about Jesus and his love and his care for us. When that's preached, your life will change. Your faith will build. Your worship will go upward. And you'll quit looking down and start looking up. Luke chapter 1. Ooh, Lord, just let that preaching thing be upon me today. Clothe me with that anointing. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 31, verse 32, verse 33, and then I'm going to go from there to 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. And I'll be going to Philippians, I think, chapter 3. But we'll get to all of them. We're going to read them, and then I'll preach. Is that all right? Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 31. Beginning at verse 31, 32, and 33. Do you have it? And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. Mm. And shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great. And be called the son of the highest. Listen to these words from Gabriel. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. Who devil, look at this word. Forever. Mm, there ain't no end to that. Forever. And of his kingdom. Uh, all the folks who think this thing is going to come to an end, let me remind you of this verse. And of his kingdom there will be, shout it loud, church people, end. When you get the king, you have the, you in the kingdom. 
What's in the kingdom is in the king. His rule, his domain, his authority, his power. Whoo. Anybody in the kingdom in here? Let's, let's go a little further. Some people think, well, well the kingdom's outside. I, Paul said, behold, the kingdom of God dwelleth within you. All of the authority and the power, the love that the king has can dwell in me and dwell in you. That's what keeps us going. First John. Hallelujah. First John chapter four, verse fourteen. Do you have it? One verse. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as a Savior of the world. That sounds very simple and elementary, but let the depth of those words sink into your spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Philippians, turn there with me, then I'll begin. Philippians chapter 2, I'm sorry. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 beginning there. Do you have that? I hear some pages. I'll wait. I want you to see this. You've got to hear this. Verse 9, chapter 2 of Philippians. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, him being Jesus, and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and on those on earth and in the unseen world that is described by Paul here very briefly, and those that are under the earth. He said in every dimension, Jesus takes preeminence above everything in everyone and every name. Are you with me? And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God, the Father. In Bible days, we read and know that parents took great, they went to great expense and pains of naming, naming their children. Do you remember naming your children and you thought about it long and hard what they would be called? Because once you name them, that's, their name and it will be with them for the rest of their lives names at times tell us a little about who they will be even before they become what they should huh. you think about names it's hard to think about names names like Brett Favre Maybe you're not a football fan. I'm not too much now because of what they're doing in the NFL. I'm just being honest with you. If you want to protest, protest. But do not dishonor our veterans and the flag in which they fought so hard for their freedom. 
you have the right to protest. We live in that nation. The laws are made. But don't use the flag as a, as a protest, to protest against the very thing that gave you the freedom in the first place. You think about names, you think about Brett Favre. He was a quarterback for many years, won a lot of things. Think about names, you think about Michael Jordan. What you think about? You think about football, you think about Michael Jordan. What? You, what? Basketball? Huh. Think about Babe Ruth. You think about hockey? Come on, somebody. Think about baseball. His name and what he done is synonymous. His name is synonymous with who he is and what he done. You cannot take away and separate the names of the men, just the men in general that have done great things on the basketball court, on the football field, on the baseball field. You think about Abraham Lincoln. You don't think about the railroad. You think about the presidency. You think about freedom from slavery. You think about the Emancipation Proclamation. You think about a man who endured and, and, and went through the bloodiest battle ever known in America history and survived it until a man took his life. When you think about men like that, that what they've done is synonymous with their name. They are, they are so tied to what they've done. You cannot think of nothing else. When you hear their name, nothing else but what they've done. Am I right? When you think about Abraham, what comes to mind? He was a father of faith. Took his son on a mountain. Believe God when there wasn't a Bible and there wasn't no law and there wasn't nothing to go by except the voice of God. I'm praying God gets us back to that. I know we got the word of God, but let me tell you, we need to be sensitive to the voice of God in these last days. Are you hearing me? When you think about the Apostle Paul, what do you think about? You think about 13 epistles to the Gentiles. Think about a man on the road to Damascus to Damascus being knocked off his beast by the power of God and blinded for three days. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And a man comes in and lays his hand on him and he receives his sight again. Come on, somebody. When you think, when I say the word, when the name Peter, who do you, what do you think about Peter? He's a man that got out of the boat, walked on the water. Come on, somebody. But he's also the man that's Whew, he's got full emotions overriding him. You try to take my Jesus, I'll cut your head off. He cuts a man's ear off. Are you hearing me? You think about Peter, you think about that. When you think about John the Revelator, you can't help but go to what he's seen in the book of Revelation. When you think of Daniel, you think about lions' mouths being shut all night long and them not being able to eat that man of God. Hallelujah. When I say Shadrach, Meshach, and the Benigo, what do you think about? You think about men who were plunged into a fire, ready to meet their death, but who did they meet? They met the man I'm going to talk about, Right now, they met him in the fire. Hallelujah to God. Whew. You think about Ezekiel. You think about a man who had a wife who died, who couldn't mourn her and her death. Who the Bible said God told him to lay naked by the gate to show Israel what they how they were doing and what, how it was making him feel. A man, you might not know this, a man that God said, I want you to take, make you a cake out of human dung. Ezekiel thought, man, that's pretty tough. So he prayed and God said, okay, I'll, I'll erase that, but you're going to eat some dung, just make it out of cow dung. Hallelujah to God. Read your Bible. Think about Jeremiah. First thing comes in my mind is a man who constantly weeps and cries over the nation of Israel. Come on, somebody. 
who they are and their names are synonymous with what they did and what they carried out in their life. Let me tell you, when it comes to the end of your life and your name is mentioned long after you are gone, what will they think about in your neighborhood and on your job and in your family with who you are and what they've done? Let me tell you, on the contrary of the good, there are men's names <laughs> like Ahab. When it, comes to not, when it comes to mind, what do you think about? I think about Jezebel. I'm not so much thinking about him as I am his diabolical demonic wife who controlled him and the country of Israel for years. Come on, somebody. You think about those names and it either gives you a good feeling or a bad feeling. And no matter how much tinsel and lights you put on the names, if they are bad and they did bad things, you cannot dress that thing up enough to make people change their mind about that person. When I, hear, when I say the name, and boy, this is a tough one, two of them, when I say the name Adolf Hitler, what comes to mind? The annihilation and extermination of over 7 million Jews. How can a man kill seven million people and get away with it? He will never get away with that. Paul said every knee, every knee will bow. One day Hitler will bow his head in shame before the Jewish king. His name is Jesus. Alexander the Great will bow before Jesus Christ. Buddha will bow before the Lord. Mohammed will kneel and bow before Jesus Christ, both old and young, both great and small, both under the earth, on the earth, and above the earth, Paul said, will bow to the name and the person of Jesus Christ. And you tell me not to praise him and honor him and give him glory. Can you clap your hands to him one more time? <laughs> Benjamin was called Benoni, which means the son of sorrow. He was named by the dying gasp of his mother when he was being burned. Who? Rachel expressing her sorrow. His name was later changed to Benjamin because of his father Jacob. He saw that he was a fortunate child to be born, although his mother had died in that childbirth. Benjamin means son. Of the right hand. Huh. Hannah had long prayed for a son, and when God granted her request, she named him Samuel. His name means asked of God. He is the first prophet of the Old Testament. He sets the pace for everyone else. Mm, 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 mm. Isaac is born. His name means laughter. He was pretty comical probably to be around. He's probably about like my sister. She laughs all the time. I believe Susan laughs in her sleep. I go to her house and drink coffee and all she does is laugh. I say something, she laughs. I say something else, she laughs. And then all of a sudden it gets contagious and I start laughing. 
And all we can do is laugh. Let me tell you, you need to be around somebody who laughs a lot in your life. We enough around, we, we around people enough that frown and that are depressed. Moses, Moses is given his name by Pharaoh's daughter. His name means to be drawn out. Woo. To be drawn out because he was taken out of the Nile. But when I say Moses, what does your mind go to? Sinai, the Red Sea, the Ten Commandments, the Tabernacle of Meeting. Come on, somebody. Therefore, the name of our Lord is not without great significance. Mary had no difficulty in finding a name for her son. Long before his birth, God had already made a choice. Long before he was born, God had already given him a name. It was in heaven and now it was upon the angel's lips to tell Mary. And he drops that into the ears of Mary. Mm. The angel said, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Let me ask you a minute. Close your eyes. I, I, I'm getting ready to preach. Close your eyes a minute here. When I say the name Jesus, what does it do to you? Matter of fact, I want you to say his name with me right now. Jesus. What, what kind of feelings and emotion does that bring into your heart, into your soul and mind? Instantly it floods with knowledge. I dare say when you say his name, you think about when he saved you. You think about a moment in your life when you were broke and he provided for you. You think about a moment when you were sick and he came and he healed you. You think about a moment when you were chained and shackled and you didn't know a way out and all of a sudden the door opens and there is Jesus. Can, can, can I get an amen? When I say his name, it brings peace to our minds. It makes hell flee away. You can be standing in a funeral home and say Jesus in death has to permit you to come by. Hallelujah. Because even he knows the name of Jesus. 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 He was called Jesus because the express, because this expresses the purpose for which he came into the world. Hear me now, hear me please. The one and only reason, the purpose of Jesus coming into the world was not to make all of us as his children rich and famous. Regardless of what popular Christianity is saying, it was not to do that. It was not to do those things. It was not to give us a glamorous lifestyle. Though there are blessings in serving Jesus. And he does give you prosperity. But make no mistake about it, that is not and was not his first intention and God's to send him into this world. God's intentions was to do the one thing that we cannot live with and the one thing we cannot live without. The one thing that we needed the most was to be delivered from sin and the consciousness and the guiltiness of that sin. He sent him as a savior. Make no mistake. I've told you this many times. I didn't come to Jesus because I needed a job. I didn't go to Jesus because I was broke. I didn't come to Jesus because I needed a house to live in. I didn't come to the Lord because I needed a new pickup truck. I didn't come to Jesus because my mind was spinning. I didn't come just because I was addicted to drugs and alcohol. I came because I knew I needed a savior to save me from my sins. And if I didn't get him I was going down for the last time 
So when you shout, you ain't shouting because of money. You ain't shouting because of what he gave you. He ain't, you ain't shouting because of things. You shout because of the redemption of the blood of Jesus that has cleansed you and made you whole. The older I get in Jesus, the less things matter. You know what I call count being rich? It's when you lay your head on your pillow at night and you say to God while you whisper in the dark, if I don't wake up, I'll be in your arms. Let me tell you something right now. To know Jesus is to love him. Feel his great presence. In Give me just a few more minutes, can you? All of the names of our Lord that are written in the Scripture, there is none sweeter. There is, none, there is none sweeter than the name of Jesus. Am I right? Can you shout that name loud for me? Jesus! I remember an old song we used to sing a long time ago when I first got saved. The saints sung it. I hadn't heard it in a long time. When you start talking about the name of Jesus, them old songs, it meant something. And they were birthed out of the consciousness and revelation of the name of Jesus. I remember my daddy. Different ones when I was a little boy, they'd sing this song. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know Fills my every longing And keeps me singing as I go His name The name of Jesus is so sweet, not because it sounds pleasant, or that we pronounce it just right, but it expresses the mission and love of Jesus that he was sent to this earth to accomplish in our lives. This makes the name of Jesus exceptionally beautiful. For when you think of Jesus, you think of love. Come on, somebody. You think of kindness. You think of peace. You think of patience. You think of comfort. You think of forgiveness. You think of all that is good. It's wrapped up in this name. Oh, my. This man, he groans in Gethsemane. This man cries from Calvary. This man named Jesus. Who? Wrapped in the names, wrapped in the name of Jesus is the healing of all humanity. It is the binding of the broken hearts that is wrapped up in the name of Jesus. It is the deliverance of the captives that is in the name of Jesus. And it is the recovery of the sight to the blind that is in the name of Jesus. The world over Jesus is Savior. The sun never sets on a nation who hasn't heard somewhere in the darkness or the light precious name that I'm preaching about today the name of Jesus Isaiah 49 and 6 says I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth because he is Jesus he saves his people from their sins 
Let me tell you something right now. It's elementary and it's, and it's, and it's just as right down there where we are living today. Let me tell you. I am thankful for one thing and everything hinges on that and that I have been delivered and saved from my sins. Do you know you've been delivered from sin and you've been saved from sin? Let me see your hand. You know the blood still cleanses and still washes you white as snow. That prophet, same prophet said, come and let us reason together. What? Hey! Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white like wool. Woo. Come on and let us reason together. When you get saved, you're reasoning with God. You're looking at all the options. Let me tell you, when you look at your life, there ain't much to give up that ain't already been given up. Everything's already been taken from you anyhow. Why, why, why reason long at all? Hallelujah. If you're already down and out, my God, come on to Jesus. I mean, hey, just throw it all in and say, you know what? I've tried to fix it and I cannot. I've tried to work it out and I cannot. I've tried to heal my mind and I cannot. I've tried the uh, other places to get free from addiction and I cannot. Let me try Jesus and see if that God that they talk about can free me, hallelujah, from sin. Years ago, I, when I got saved and delivered, I got up that day and for 30-something years now, I have my lip. I've never tasted another drink. I've not put another narcotic in my mouth. I've not smoked another cigarette I've never rolled another joint since that night and months into my relationship with God it dawned on me that I didn't even want those things no more and I asked God why don't I desire that he said, Philip, I didn't take your habit away. I cleansed your sin problem. And the reason you got a habit is because you're trying to cover up your sin. So he said, I didn't deal with your habit. I dealt with your sin. And when I dealt with your sin, your habit left. <laughs> And I realized for the first time, I've been praying for people to get delivered from their habit. You need to get delivered from your sin. And if that leaves, your habit will leave. You won't drink no more. You won't smoke no more. You will walk different. You will talk different. Everything in your life will change because of Christ. Am I right, shouty man? Hey, our problems are sin problems, not habit problems. Habits are the byproducts of sin. They are the byproducts of sin. Ask an alcoholic. His plan wasn't become an alcoholic. But alcohol helped him drown something else deeper. But once God dug that up, and got rid of it the alcoholic said I don't need that no more cause the reason I was doing that in the first place was to cover up what God dug up and delivered me from in the first place Does, come on somebody if any man be in Christ in Christ in Christ he is a what somebody shout it loud he is a what shout it again what Shout it to me, what? On this side, what are you? New creature. I 
I still change the hearts of men and women, says the Lord. I still send my grace and my word as a scalpel to open them up and to change their life. Even this morning, I'm a God of change. I'm a miracle-working God, says the Lord. I can change everything in a moment. Only trust me and believe me and watch me do the impossible, says the Spirit of the Lord. Listen to me. Can you put that up, Nathaniel, what I told you? This is what I preached years ago. I didn't preach it just like this. It's always different. It's like making a cake. You never make it the same way. Got the same ingredients in it. I don't know why one turns out flat and the other turns out fluffy. But that's just the way it goes. Am I right, cooks? Let me hear it. Let me, am I right? Nathaniel, are you, here we go. There's a scripture in 1 John 4. Somebody turn there, turn there, quick. I just read it a while ago. 1 John 4. Was it 14? 1 John 4, 14. Who's got it? You got it? Jump up and preach with me. I mean, I want you to tell it like you're preaching. Can you do it? <laughs> and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son... Say that, say that two words right there, hath. Sent. Say it again. Sent. Say it again. Sent. He has sent. Sent. <laughs> he has sent the Son. Keep reading. Just rest there. As Savior of the world. A Savior of the world. Many, many years ago, I preached a message entitled, Do You Have That One Sent? Sent. Sent by the Father. The one sent. The one, the one sent. Now there's two one sent in the room today. You got the one sent that I'm talking about. He came from glory. His name is Jesus. He can deliver you from your sin. Or that day I remember passing out hundreds of one cents. I gave them to everyone in the church that morning. And I told them, I said, do you have, do you have that one cent? Now, what's interesting about this, it, I don't know if it has penny on it, but it does have one cent. What's interesting about this, and I draw the comparison between this and Jesus as an object lesson. This was my sermon. And I said, look at this one. Are y'all with me? I said, look at this one cent. I said, there's a word there. Can anybody read it right above the house? What does it say? What does it mean? Out of many, out of many, out of many, <laughs> out of many, one. And I looked at that and I said, God, you have called us out of many. And you have made us one because of that one. Say it with me. That one. Mm -hmm, not this one. Maybe our forefathers had a revelation of Jesus and then just put it on the penny. Out of many, one. And we are one because of this one sent. And then I thought about over here on this side, it says, in what? The one sin I'm talking about is God in whom we trust. Somebody shout amen. And I said, then I thought about the man that is on the one sin. Who is he? What did he do? He did what? 
What did he, somebody shouted out loud, what did Abraham Lincoln do? He freed the slaves. Now that one sent there, and that man there might have freed the slave, but the one sent I'm talking about this morning has freed the slaves. Can anybody, can anybody hear me here today? Long before Abraham Lincoln ever showed up, there was a freedom sent from heaven. There was a one cent sent from God. And that one cent still delivers, frees from slavery. That one cent is still God and we trust in him. That one cent still has called many and made them one. Come on, somebody. Mm -mm. This one sin here is what they call legal tender. It pays and is responsible for paying all of your. Oh my God. It pays all of your <laughs> private. It don't matter. If you can see them or if you can't see them. If it's been alone, nobody knows about. If there's something hanging over your head that money can exonerate, this one cent can free you from the debt that is upon your life. Let me tell you, though, that God sent one that frees us from the debt of sin and the cruelty of it all. Hallelujah. Can you shout amen? Let me tell you, I was in debt way over my head to sin. I thought, my God, I can't never pay back what I have charged on my life. I have went crazy. I'm wild. I cannot get it done. He steps in the room and says, I discharge him. I'm paying his debt. It's all over. I'm wiping your slate clean. You're going to be free today. Hallelujah to God. Anybody in here got any debt? Let me see your hand. I mean, real debt. How would you act if somebody came by your house and said, how much do you owe in this place? Cars, credit cards, tax bills, groceries, school loans, Put it all together. Why? I'm going to totally exonerate your debt for you. I don't know if I could say, stand up, Brother Mark. I don't know if I could just say, I appreciate that very much. You know, I, I think sometime that's how we treat Jesus. Amen. We walk in and shake his hand and say, thank you for exonerating me and delivering me from my debt of sin. And thank you for washing me in the blood. I, I appreciate that. No, no. Let me tell you, please don't think bad of me for what I'm about to do. Hold that. <laughs> if this man came to my house, look here, just come and just act like you knocked on my door right here. Touch him today. Hello? What? That's right. Check right here. Come on. Are you serious? You don't even hardly know me. It don't matter. I know you. You do know me. Who sent you? Somebody a little more jubile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. I don't 
don't know if I could just do this. I think now what I'd probably do. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> 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 tell you when when you've been delivered and you've been free you look at your account and there is nothing there that can hold you now you have no indebtedness hallelujah the paper has been clean at the top of it says fresh start oh my God does anybody hear me here today And see, let me tell you something right now. What the devil's scheme is, is to tell you that, well, that only happened one time in your life and that that's pretty much it and you you know you just gonna have to deal with it and uh, you know you just a basket case in the camp of Christ and he just ain't gonna do much for you you don't had that experience one time in your life and, and and you might as well get over it that you're gonna have these things and it's gonna be like this etc 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 we can listen to that devil and most of us have and what we've done is we've lost our appreciation for what the Lord Jesus has has done for us in our life to deliver us. We have lost the account that has been scratched out. And we used to show the devil that when we'd pray and he'd tell us we're not going to make it. We'd say, oh no, look at this. Jesus has done stamped it. Hallelujah. It's signed, sealed, praise God, and delivered. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. I come by to remind somebody that that one sin is still here. That that one sin still discharges debtors. That that one sin still delivers sinners. That one sin still loves you unconditionally. Stand on your feet. That one sin. Do you have that one sin? I dare say everybody in America's got one of them in the pocket. But ain't everybody in America got one of these one cents in their pocket in their life? I know this is simple. But it's the gospel. And the gospel is good news. Excuse me a minute. While you sit there remembering, I'm just going to go up here and hug this cross a minute. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for the freedom. You remember when you came here? You remember what you were thinking when you showed up here? You remember how you felt when you came here? Not the church. The cross. People say, man, if we could just get them in church. No, if we get them to the cross, they'll find a church. My objective is not to make members of you. My objective is to make children of God of you. And if you become a child of God, you'll want to join. (laughs) You'll want to be a part. Your life will change. Old song. When I grabbed this cross, it's an old song. It's one of them years ago songs. They don't sing it much. They don't play it much. Huh. Archives. It's an antiquity. There is room at the cross for you. There is room 
at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There is room at the cross for you. You ever heard that song? You remember that in years gone by when you was a child, heard it in church. There's still room at this cross. With all the wicked going on in the world and the uncertainty, I'm glad to know that ISIS can't blow Calvary up. You may blow up our buildings. You may damage our places of history. But they will never take away the Golgotha's Hill and the memory that is there. My question is, do you have that one sin? Not this one. That one. That one. That one. Bow your heads with me, Heavenly Father. I've tried to yield myself to you today to speak and say what you told me. I've heard you twice in this service challenge us to believe you and watch what you do. I've heard it twice from two sources. And then God with me preaching it. Two is better than one and a threefold cord is not easily broken. So you have made something strong in here today. Something we can hold on to. And Lord, if there are people on the sound of my voice, first of all, if they're lost, they don't know you. 